Mercury intrusion. It's widely used, so let's have a look at it. It can be also quite useful. The application is from 2 nanometer to 400, <coughs> and it, it, no, well, from the st structure, the, the largest porosity, and then down to 2 nanometer. And 2 nanometer compares to the 400 megapascal. It provides information on the characteristic pore sizes and the total accessible porosity. And the principle is that you pressure this non-wetting liquid into the pores and we have, assuming that the pores are circular, we can use the Wasborn equation which we have here, that the pressure is related to the um, surface tension of the mercury and the contact angle and then the diameter of the pore. So, how do we measure? We mesh, press mercury into the porous material which has been dried beforehand and increasing pressure causes the mercury to go into smaller and smaller pores. We have to precondition the sample, we have to dry it beforehand, so that's one of the matters of consideration. And then the pores are not cylindrical in the material we are looking at. The contact angle depends on the nature of the material. And uh, there's a 13 degrees difference between uh, different materials which have been dried, the so-called peat dried and oven dried samples. And that causes a 30% difference in the intruded diameter. So it's not just uh, peanuts. Surface tension varies also, and these values, you could use the different values and then make a sensitivity analysis of your data. Then there's a potential problem of uh, damage of the pore structure. And then finally, the grain size that's the size of the, um, the sample, you, you crush it into pieces and the size of the grains which you end up with. And the smaller the grains, the more, less impact you have on the characteristic pore sizes. The smaller the characteristic pore sizes, the larger the characteristic pore sizes get because you can more easily enter the pores. So you will have different ingress curves depending on the sample size until a certain limit. When the samples then get larger and larger, you have the characteristic pore sizes, which is uh, reflecting the material's characteristics. This is an apparatus where you can see where the sample is conditioned, and initially you um, have mercury just surrounding your material, so in that way you can determine the, the volume of the sample. Here we have some examples, and they're very recent. It's for, from uh, one of the projects in the last Marie Curie project, uh, which is on uh, the impact of slag and curing on the porosity of um, cementitious materials. What we look at here is the impact of slag on the total pore volume and on the threshold pore size. And the first graph here is on the total pore volume. And it's paste with uh, no slag and 40% and 70% slag. Uh, we have a constant water to bind the volume initially and the samples were cured at 20 degrees and saturated. And here we s you see the variation in pore volume as a function of time. And what you see initially, we have a larger, well, after one day, less of the slag has hydrated, so we have a larger volume of pores. And even at 800 days, we have a larger volume of pores. But when we look at the threshold pore diameter, you can see that the slag has this ref impact. It refines the pore structure. At early age, we have the uh, coarse 
threshold pore sizes, but then already around uh, 28 days, the slag provides uh, more resistance to ingress. We have these threshold pores, uh, threshold pores becoming smaller and smaller. So a refinement of the structure. And that's what you also see from other data. So the method can be used to illustrate that this considering that the way we treat the sample <coughs> beforehand, the conditioning doesn't have an impact on the pore structure. And here the samples were, were dried by isopropanol, so solvent exchange. <coughs> The surface area, that's another parameter we might want to characterize and that can be used by measuring the absorption. It could be water absorption, but it could also be nitrogen absorption. And nitrogen absorption is used for many materials. It provides information on the pore system in the range from 2 to 30 nanometer typically uh, and its radius specific surface area where we use, uh, where we calculate, and uh, the open porosity. And then I have a comment here, not the high density CSH according to Jen's model, but that, that's the model with the globular. And I'm not talking about that model here that much, so it's... The principle is that you have absorption first, and then you have the condensate. And then you can determine this BT surface, the, the amount of gas necessary to, uh, to cover the surface with one layer of uh, molecules. And you use the BT equation for that. And there are some assumptions that the, you have a plain homogeneous surface and that the energy is different uh, of the first layer, is different from the rest of the layers, and that you don't have any uh, interaction between the absorbing material and the absorbate, the, su the substrate, between the, the um, absorbate and the surface. So here you see the calculation, so diagram, BT diagram, which is typically used to determine these uh, parameters, as we can get a straight line between these two, where we have the, um, it's the amount of material compensated, and then the, um, now we have to go back and see, the relative vapor pressure here. And we have some values which are used if you want to use, uh, calculate for water vapor. So how is it measured? Well, for nitrogen, you have uh, varying relative pre gas pressures, and that's the same for, for the water vapor. And then you have the material to add or desorb on the surface. And, well, it's a well-known method. So that's why it's used so often. But then again, you have the problem with the, um, or you may have the problem with the effect of conditioning the samples. And what you get is information of the smaller porosity. Here you see an example, or examples for, for three different materials. It's a reference, it's the same reference as you saw for the low temperature calorimetry. And then we have a sample with some bentonite substitution of 10% 10, 10 of the cement is substituted with bentonite or with silica fume. A bentonite, is a, it's a fine clay and it has been intermixed in a way that we, we know it's well distributed. What we see here is for s seven days, there's not much difference between the materials, whereas for for, for one day, there's not much difference, but, but as for seven days, the silica fume has a, paste with silica fume has a larger surface area, and the bentonite paste also has a larger surface area than the reference. So it can be used to characterize the impact of 
these mm. ad supplementary materials on the the paste the structure of the paste. And this is what we see. And from this, these curves, then we can determine the, the surface area of the materials. So, the next. Yep. Uh, we see that we have a difference between the surface area measurement between a ga a nitrogen adsorption and a water absorption. Mm -hmm. And many authors explain that this phenomenon is due to the um, size of the molecule and others speak about the um, ability of the water to just be linked to the surface of the solid. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I, I think it's a combination, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think combination of the size and, and then the affinity between the material and uh, the filling and the substrate and the filling material, yes. The pore size distribution, we can use microscopy if we have an isotropic structure and that was the question we had earlier. We can use a change in the state of a filling material of a given conditioning. Could be temperature, where we could use the low temperature calorimeter of when we are heating the sample of, of the thawing curve. Because we have the problem with the ink bottles during freezing, but the thawing curve we can use considering that some of the ice or the, some of the pore liquid is actually a brine which is not frozen. And we also may have layer on the surface which is not frozen, so we have to add that. But we can use that. Then we can use vapor pressure, water in the hygroscopic range where there's absorption analysis, and we can use uh, suction, as you saw with the clay material in the over hygroscopic layer in the high relative humidity range. And finally, we can use nuclear mag magnetic resonance, which is something which was introduced in the last Marie Curie project and which will be used by several of you in uh, this project. And uh, we will have a special lecture on that later because this is a technique which, which is going to be used by several of you. And uh, that will be a presentation by Peter McDonnell. So this is just an overview. But if we look at the water absorption, it gives information on pore size range, uh, range from 1 to 30 nanometer, and it's in the hygroscopic range, as I've mentioned. And the principle is that the, the apparent pore size distribution can be determined using this curve. Now it's, it's the thickness of the adsorbed layer first, and then if you look at the um, formation of the of the content or the condensation of water, you can use Kelvin equation, where you have the link between the relative humidity here and the Kelvin radius. So how do you do, and that was the question we had earlier, here we have the old-fashioned way where we have desiccators and we have the, our samples and down here we have a salt solution and typically you will keep it in a box which is temperature controlled and you will have the stirring so you ensure that you have the right vapor, uh, water vapor pressure uh, above. The advantages, you can use virgin sample at least the first time you do the desorption. It's well known and the disadvantage, it's slow when you're using salt solutions and you may have continued hydration of your sample. You may have shrinkage and you will have shrinkage and creep if you go to lower relative humidities. And then there are some assumptions in connection with the analysis that 
that that's the pore shape. That's the same for the other methods also, that you make assumptions on the shape of the pores to do the calculation. Pressure to pore size or uh, freezing temperature to pore size and here vapor pressure to pore size. And then you also assume you have to make some assumptions of the hysteresis or no hysteresis. This is a um, photo showing some chambers uh, which, which you have at the uh, DTU where sa samples are hanging. It's also used for many other materials. And here uh, it's used for wood where the samples are hanging in the controlled uh, climate. And then this, these samples are weighed at intervals, weighted at intervals. And this is controlled. And what you can see in this chamber here is that this is used at high relative humidity and there you have to be careful that you don't have condensation on the uh, on the window. And the same can happen in uh, desiccators that you may have condensation on the lids and then you will have a difference in the relative humidity on your samples. So you don't want condensated water to drip down on your samples. Here we have an example. That's the same materials as you saw before. Now it's just uh, water desorption. And here again we can see that the silica fume has more absorption at low rel uh, relative humidity or what we saw, low pressure of the nitrogen. And we can also see that the silica fume sample has less porosity when we come up to the 97% relative humidity. So based on this, where we don't measure the, the uh, pores in the over hygroscopic range, it seems that the pore structure is, uh, the total pore volume is lower in this range and that the pores are finer. And this is also according to expectations. And what we also see is that the bentonite actually has an impact on the pore structure of the material. So, again, when we then look, this is, uh, we talked already of hysteresis, but I'll just mention, well, there's a definition that's a difference between the desorption and the adsorption isotherms. And it's caused by this difference in the shape or variation in shape and then we have to consider the ink bottles and here you see again the uh, an example of absorption isotherm where we both have the sorption isotherm and then the s s suction curve and for this material the suction curve is extremely important to describe the whole sorption isotherm because we have so many pores in this over hygroscopic range. Suction analysis used to determine the water content in the over hygroscopic range and the apparent uh, pore size distribution. And you have, um, you measure values of the water content and relatively vapor pressure at constant temperature, as you did with the other, and then you get the suction curve and you need, you have a saturated sample, you start off with a saturated sample and then you subject it to a given pressure and then you have many skies to form depending on the pressure. The advantage of this that you can apply it on a virgin sample, non-dried sample the problem is that it's time consuming and often it's also difficult. You, you, you place your sample on uh, clay membranes and they are not all with that durable. So it's, it's a difficult test to make. But it can be done and it is done. Here you see such a setup where we have the pressure plates, different types depending on which pressure they are to go up to. And then I have a 
separate file on the uh, NMR, which was kindly prepared by Peter McDonald. And the basis is that the, if you impose a magnetic field on a, a proton, it will spin and, and uh, you will have a relaxation of the spin. And here you can see that the, you excite it and you then get a decay in the spin. And this is the same curve, it's just drawn up that you have the relaxation here. If you have material which is free, mobile water, bulk water, it will have a long relaxation time. If you have a material which is a salt, so less mobile, it will have a short relaxation time. So you can distinguish between these. And here you can see the relaxation times that they go from micro microseconds and to seconds. And for the long relaxation times, it's bulk water, it's free water. Whereas for the lower the relaxation time or the smaller the relaxation time, the more fixed the water is. So from water in large pores, water in small port pores, and then the bound water. When you measure the, you have a relaxation time and the, it's a mixture between the bound water and the water inside the pore. And this epsilon, it's uh, the thickness of the uh, one layer, uh, thickness of the, the um, absorbed water. So you get information of the volume to surface ratio. Then when you are to transfer this or determine the radius or the size of the pores, you need to make some assumptions. Are they circular or are they cylindrical? And here you can see that we have, from this curve, it's an example that you have a signal from a given pore and you can make a Laplace uh, transformation and then you get information on the uh, T2 distribution, the distribution of the relaxation times and then through these assumptions of the pore shape you can get information on the pore size distribution. Here if we have examples of um, a white Portland cement paste which has been hydrated, water cement rate 2.5 and you see the change in relaxation time as a function of curing. So we start up here one hour and down to one week. And you see here, initially you have a lot of water at high relaxation time, free water, and then it's decreasing and the, the water becomes bound or fixed in, in small pores. And here it's transformed to pore size. So again, you see the, the large pore sizes and then the fine pore size, small pore size. And we'll not return to this. I should have omitted it. When you are measuring, making repeated pulses, you can also use the technique to determine the diffusion between pores. And what we see here is that this is a, we have, apparently we have two um, pore size pores in two ranges. We have some larger and some smaller. And with this repeated technique, we can see how much of the uh, water is going from one pore size, small pore size to a large and from a large to a small. And that gives us information on the diffusion rate of the water in the pore structure. And here you see an example of a white Portland cement 0.4 water cement ratio where it seems that we have discrete pore sizes, not a continuous distribution, but discrete pore sizes. And apparently we don't have any gel porosity. 
here, but we have, well, except that we have distribution between the gel and the capillary. There are other techniques, which I'm not mentioning in detail, but they are, you could use confocal microscopy, which I know that they have access to at Imperial College. Um, you can use atomic force microscopy. Confocal microscopy, you can look into the sample, and they have, uh, as far as I remember, made some very interesting work looking at Hadley grains and how they're connected to the remaining pore structure. You can use atomic force microscopy, which is in principle is a, uh, if you use a gramophone and you're measuring the distance, the force between this, the material and the, your sensor. And with that, you can make, um, uh, determine the, the surface rough, roughness or the, the distribution here. And this is an example for um, what's meant ratio, the same, or well, sample similar to the samples I've used, uh, examples from, from many, that's the reference here, to 20 months, and it has been fractured. It's qualitative, it's not quantitative. And you have also the problem that the samples start, start to dry when you're treating them. Then you can use small angle neutron scattering and uh, ex small angle X-ray scattering. So, in summary, oops, we have these variation in pores uh, sizes from nanometer to micrometer, and we have the definitions varying. We have that the pore structure is affected by drying and heating. So you need to consider that when doing, both when undertaking work yourself, but also when you're reading papers, using data. There are several methods which can be used to determine both pore structure and water fixation. And when you are selecting the methods, you should consider the property you want to have information on, the size range you want to measure, and then possible adverse effects. I would suggest that in many um, cases you would use a, a combination of methods so you actually get these. This is a graph showing uh, the applicability of the various methods um, in, in which range you can use them. And uh, I haven't included the NMR, but that would be in the entire range. So what you see is that when, if you're using low temperature calorimetry, which you could use on a virgin sample, which could be quite useful, you cannot describe well the, the larger pores. They will just be in, in the, the... When you determine the... Um, in the larger range, it will be from that range that you can actually take 40 nanometer or something like that, and then upwards and then you will have a signal for all the, the bulk water freezing in your sample. And if you look at mercury here, you can detect a higher range, but you have the problem that you need to condition, and you can't go that low as with the water, water sorption or low temperature calorimetry. If you had transmission electromicroscopy, you could go even, could go as low also here. <coughs> and to sum up, just to illustrate that depending on which property you want to describe, you could consider selecting different methods. Of course, it's also it's a question about availability and how long time does it take? What's the cost of, of doing this? So you can see for total porosity, you actually have several methods, but when you look at the, well, both space filling and low temperature calorimetry and NMR, it, the porosity needs to be filled. 
If you have no water in the porosity, you won't detect it. Moisture fill porosity, yes. Civil methods. Threshold pore sizes, we have two methods which can give us, give us information on this. The low temperature calorimetry, where we can use virgin samples, or mercury intrusion, where we need to condition the samples. The surface area, the BT, but we can also use the BT for the water. It doesn't need to be nitrogen. Pore size distribution, the microscopy, the space filling, low temperature calorimetry, the heating curve, and the NMR. And the methods are based on assumptions. So therefore, I, it's, it's a good idea to use several methods. The pore shape, well, you, it's primary microscopy. There are descriptions that you can use um, absorption data also for describing the pore shape. And then interconnectivity, where we have the transport between different pores, the diffusivity of water, that would be the NMR you would choose. And the state of water, the sorption, the low te temperature calorimetry, and the NMR. <coughs> That's it. Any questions? Yes, please. From this table, I can see that you have no method to characterize tortuosity, and that, along with interconnectivity, is the most important maybe to characterize water transport. I'm asking this because my PhD topic is modeling water transport and cement paste. Yeah, I, I think we will come back to that in the afternoon. Okay. This has not focused on transport as such. Okay. Another question, do you know what is the best resolution we can get out of CT scan? Computer tomography? Or why the best resolution? No. I know that they have done some work. Uh, Emmanuel Gallucci at Cannes Scrivener has done work uh, from EPFL. I think it was in Korea. And they got quite some good resolution. I've only used CT scanning for uh, looking at distribution of fibers in fiber reinforced concrete. It's a totally different resolution. Because you can get the total 3D structure, which might be very interesting. Yeah. If you can go down to a very good resolution yes. first. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Excuse me, my question was on this also, like on 3D, yeah. so you suggest to use this X-ray tomography and AFM or confocal, right? Not AFM for the 3D. Well, you have to break up your sample and, and you have to, you need a very flat surface. No, you don't need a flat surface, but I would use the x-ray. But the AFM is so much more readily available. So just for looking at my samples, I would use that. But I wouldn't, you don't have the picture of the pore structure. And where the sample breaks, it would be at the weakest point. So it wouldn't be necessarily representative. Yes, I've never used it myself, and, uh, but that should be useful, yes. Yeah, it's it's not as useful as X-ray yeah. tomography. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, I think it's quite fantastic to see a picture where you go through the microstructure and can see how it's interconnected. Yeah. Other questions? I think that that's 
the NAM part and the surface area measurement. When you crash the sample before the water fraction compared to the just sample, the solid sample. Yeah. I, uh, I know that Veronique, um, and I can't pronounce her surname, from LCPC, <laughs> she um, has been working on this. And we are also doing some comparisons, but I don't have the data here. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't answer your question. More? Okay, thank you.